Howdy! <laughs> I'm an archetype. <laughs> no, Praise God. Hallelujah. Can I hear the name of Jesus? Oh, I think that could be done better, don't you? Count of three. One, two, three. Jesus. I still think it could be done better. One, two, three. Jesus! I hear better shouts at the Giants game than I heard then. Oh, oh. Count of three. One, two, three. Jesus! Oh, much better, much better. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Worship team. That's the best worship we've had since I've been. That was awesome. That was awesome. Hallelujah. Well, good morning. Good morning. I'm uh, glad to be here today. I'd rather be here than any hospital in uh, Arkansas. <laughs> I know that because I was in the hospital Thursday and Friday. Thought I had a heart attack. And uh, so I went into the clinic here in uh, Sheridan and they said, you need to get to the hospital right now. And I said, okay. So I went to the hospital Thursday morning and uh, so if I turn really white and I fall down on the ground, it's probably not the Holy Spirit. <laughs> if I don't turn white and I fall on the ground, it may be the Holy Spirit. <laughs> You'll have to figure it out if I die or if I live. You know? <laughs> but I went into the hospital and they did every test and poked in front of me. I mean, I got little tape marks all over me still from the glue. Uh, they did EKGs and, and uh, and uh, all the blood work and all that kind of stuff. And they came back and said, uh, are you are, are you human? And I said, yes. They said, we're not sure. I said, well, my wife is a teeth. You know. <laughs> but uh, they poked and prodded and they got the blood work back. And the doctor came in to me and, and he said to me, he said, uh, well, everything looks good. What symptoms are you still experiencing? I felt like somebody sitting on my chest still. And uh, I've got this dizzy lightheadedness. And and he, he goes, well, we're going to give you two choices. Uh, you can go home and on Monday go in and see Dr. Jones, the cardiologist. Or you can stay overnight and in the morning we'll go up through your artery and your groin all the way up to your heart with this catheter. And look at your arteries to make sure you don't have a blockage because this one blood test tells you if you've got a complete blockage it's the only he said the only enzyme that it gives off when you uh this enzyme is only given off when you have a complete blockage in your heart and the muscle starts to die and he said that blood test came back twice at zero 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 six so he said that's not a problem but you could be on the verge of having a plug you know something happened where you like 95% plugged up and, and causing these symptoms. I said, well, I think the wisest thing would be for me to stay Thursday night and get that test in the morning. So they went in through my wrist right here, and they went in through my groin. They went through here to one side and there to the other side. Came back and said, well, you're not clean as a whistle, but you're the maximum you got is 40% blockage on one artery. So that means you got 60% left, that's good. And he said, the others are at 30 and 25. And I said, well, that's not bad for 70 years old, is it? I like bacon. <laughs> Anybody here like bacon? Every morning, two pieces of bacon, two eggs, and uh, never mind, you don't need to put out. <laughs> I want you to know, this is the graveyard of a thousand chickens. <laughs> So I've been doing my duty to make sure they get buried in the right place. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so they let me come home and said that it's probably something else. And I've got to go back to the doctor and let them look at me. And, but, uh, you know, to be quite frank with you, no, my name is Jay. I'm not but uh, to be honest, uh, when... Uh, at one point in the thing, I can't remember when it was. I think it was when I texted you. It was when I texted you that scripture that the angel of the Lord camps about me. And, uh, you know, 
How many of you know that scripture in Isaiah? That the angel of the Lord encamps about those who trust in him. And I just said that. I said, angel, do your job. Whatever's going on with me, cause it to stop. You're supposed to protect me. <laughs> and literally, I felt a lifting in my chest at that very moment. So I thank the Lord, and I thank God for wisdom that doctors have, don't you? I mean, I've got a, I've got a titanium knee and a titanium hip from all the baseball I used to play. I used to be skinnier. And uh, it's only in these latter years I've become the undertaker with chicken like that. So. <laughs> but uh, I'm glad to be here today, obviously. <laughs> Are you glad to be here today? Yeah. Are you glad to hear what the worship team brought to us and participate and give me praise and honor to God? Amen? Yeah. That was awesome. That was awesome. So, well, I've had a word for the church since before December. And um, you can tell why I might have had this word. But uh, most of you know me and Diana. You are short. Get up, get up. Get up. In Jesus' name, devil. <laughs> but uh, do I need to take a different one? No, nope, that was me. That was you? <laughs> <laughs> like I said, in Jesus' name, devil. <laughs> Just kidding, Chris. <laughs> Diane and I uh, moved here from California to about two, a little, a little under two years ago. We lived up above uh, in, in the Sacramento area, Northern California. Uh, somebody said, well, why did you move to Arkansas? Well, I was running from the law. <laughs> And they can't find me here. It's an open carry state. My book. But I do have my open carry permit. I got it out here. You know, you know why I got it? Two years ago, before, well, three years ago, before we moved, she bought me a. a uh, I gotta get this right. It's a Rhode Island Armory 1911 45 ACP semi automatic handgun. Wow. Huh? Yeah. What did I say? Well, I rode that one as long as I could. <laughs> Rock Island, yeah. See, I told you I had to work at getting it right. And I never shot it in California because I didn't want to pay $2 a bullet to practice. <laughs> and so when I came out here, I was able to get bullets cheaper. And so I saw, I tried to find a good place to go shoot it. And nobody had a place to go shoot it. And I was driving down the road and I saw this place that said uh, um, concealed carry permit classes. And I went in and talked to them. And for 75 bucks, I could get my concealed carry certificate and I get to shoot my gun. So I thought, well, seventy-five dollars to shoot this thing. I guess I'll do that. And so, so I uh, I shot it, and all of my shots were within forty feet of the target. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they were all clumped together about like that for the first time ever and shot it. And so don't mess with me. <laughs> but anyway, why am I telling you that? Because we moved from California, and. Um, you know, we moved from California because um, we just had uh, been married six years. We're pretty newly wed. And I had to get away from her family. <laughs> <laughs> Trouble is, they all moved here to Little Rock. <laughs> you know. No, we, we ended up... Uh, how many of you... Um, have ever thought that you would never have anything again in your life? No? Anybody like that? A couple of you? Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I've been in ministry most of my life. Um, I remember when I was a kid growing up, I would get ready to go to church with my dad. My dad and mom, my dad was a pastor. And that's not why I was a pastor. 
I said, I don't want to be a pastor because I saw the way people treated my dad. And I thought, those are Christians. I don't have anything, anything to do with being a pastor. You know, it's not very good for an elder to cuss your dad out in the middle of a meeting. And no matter whether he's a pastor or not. <laughs> but I said, I wouldn't even do that. But when I was like seven, eight years old, we get ready to go to church and and I'd take my bed and I'd line all my stuffed animals up on it in rows and I'd put my my toy Manchester dog at the end of the thing and I said, Skip me, preach to him while I'm gone. <laughs> and I'd go to church. So I think God was calling me to preach a long time ago. I ended up going to college up here in Joplin, Missouri and got kicked out after two years. <laughs> Can you believe that? Yeah. Can you believe I got kicked out? I was not a very, I actually went to college for one reason. I didn't know what else to do when I graduated high school. And somebody said, go to Bible college. And I said, okay. And I went and played basketball and baseball. And I was on the bowling team. Three o'clock in the morning, top of the third floor of the dorm, I would bolt my ball. Right now, <laughs> that thing would just rumble and make that old building shake. <laughs> I was on fire for God. I would take my record envelope, I would put lighter fluid in it, I'd stick it underneath the door, and I'd step on it, and we'd go all over the floor of the guy's room, and then I'd light it on fire. <laughs> so I got kicked out. <laughs> So I spent all of 1972 having been kicked out of college back down in Florida and I met a man, a man named Jim Sprummer. He wasn't my dad preaching, but he was a man preaching. I met a couple, Jim and Sandy Cheshire. They weren't my dad or they were my mom, but they loved Jesus with all their heart. They would have me over. I didn't go to church for six months after that. Because I was mad at God for getting kicked out. Didn't matter that I was a dummy that did it. <laughs> Have you ever got that where you get mad at God and it's really your fault? Yeah, most of us, we, we go, why God? And he goes, well, you want me to list the things you just did? Why did they get this accident? Because you were on your cell phone. <laughs> right? But I ended up encountering the Lord. And, and my faith went from being a faith at eight years old when I gave my life to Jesus to a genuine, deeper faith that caused me to recognize that I didn't have to love him because I didn't want to go to hell. See, most of my faith in those early years was, I didn't want to go to hell. And so I said, I love Jesus because I didn't want to go to hell. Did you hear what I said? Yes. I didn't want to go to hell. And so I believed. But in that summer of 1972, when I encountered Jesus' love, it went from a place of not wanting to go to hell to I really didn't care about hell because I was in love with Jesus. Because he loved me. And I finally realized that. So I ended up going back to that same college. They let me back in. And within three months, I was representing the school, traveling with a gospel quartet all over the Midwest. And uh, talking about Jesus and singing. I left there to join a gospel quartet back in 1974, sang from 1974 to 1982 in two different groups, traveling all over the United States. And uh, during part of that time, I was working as we were traveling, so I got a job as an RV mechanic. I had taken automotive engine rebuilding in high school, and um, so I went in and told the guy I needed a job, and he said, I don't need anybody. And I said, well, if you hire me, I'll be the best mechanic you ever had. And I said that out of, not pride, but out of confidence in what God would do. And he said, no, I don't need anybody. And so I went to work at Jack in the Box, <laughs> which is a fast food restaurant in California. 
just kings. They're coming to Little Rock, they told me, but they got good tacos, Jack in the Box, and all. I don't know. But uh, anyway, three weeks after I started at Jack in the Box, he called me up and said, I need somebody. I'll give you a chance. So that was in October of 1976. I was the service manager running 37 mechanics by January of 1980. <laughs> Would you pat me right there in the middle of the back for a minute? Oh, okay. <laughs> had nothing to do with me. I had to do everything with him. He makes a way where there's no way. He opens doors where doors are closed. Because he has something for me I don't want to talk to you about this morning. But so I worked as an RV mechanic and later became the service manager. It was the world's largest RV dealer in the world. We sold 125 more homes a month. Woo! Tires me thinking about it. Thinking about all the nights I had to sleep in a motorhome to make sure it got fixed because some of the guys wouldn't work overnight. I don't know why they have families. I don't understand that. I did too. Anyway, I did that, traveled and sang at the same time. Yay! And then I became the music minister at a church in San Jose. And I uh, had, when I was in college, that last two years I've been a youth minister in Canada in the summer, so I know what it's like to take care of kids. <laughs> it works real well. I had, this, I had this kid named Billy. I had this kid named Billy. He was a mess. He was always messing up. And, and so on one Wednesday night, he's sitting there. He's making East calling all the trouble in the world. So I said, Billy, come here. And right in front of all the young people in the group, he goes, what, Mr. Wynn? I'm, I'm young at this time, right? I'm in college. I go, uh, I'm going to give you a whipping. He goes, what? He goes, I go, I'm going to give you a whipping if you're, you're not stopping what I told you to do. He goes, you can't give me a whipping. I said, I'm giving you a whipping. Come with me. And I grabbed him by the hand. And I went in through this back door in the downstairs basement of the church there in Tyro, Kansas. And I shut that door and I turned around and looked at him. He goes, I'm not giving you a whipping, but if you tell anybody I did, then I will. <laughs> he said, no. He said, I said, now let's go back out there and you behave. I never had another problem with him. <laughs> And it was a great summer. We, <laughs> we ended up having the whole football team got saved that year. The football team in Caney, Kansas. That's right up the road here. If you go, you know. And uh, but I did that. I was a music minister. Then I became an associate pastor. Then I became a senior pastor. And I moved to Sonora, California in 1991. And uh, became to start a new church. And uh, I don't know if I should tell you all this. I can only take four minutes to do that part. So, um, and I come out of the Church of Christ Christian Church instrumental side of the coin, not the non instrumental, but the instrumental side of the coin. You know the differences. I went to Ozark Christian College and then later to San Jose Christian College, and uh, which is now William Jessup University. And when I moved up to Sonora, I got invited to go to this Thursday prayer meeting. And when I went to this Thursday prayer meeting, I was there and went in and thought, well, this is cool. I'll enjoy this. Because we're really the only church in town anyway. That's what a lot of these, a lot of our different churches believe. You know, they all believe they got such a good doctrine that they're only once going to heaven. You heard of the bus load of uh, charismatics that careened off a cliff and died. When they got to heaven, St. Peter let them in, and it's a city built four square, right? So Peter walks them over, and there's this big elevator, and he said, it's got the numbers inside, it goes up to 100, 100 floors. They all get in this big elevator with St. Peter, and they're going up, and all of a sudden St. Peter goes, shh, shh, 
Everybody be quiet. We're getting ready to go past the 25th floor. Everybody gets quiet. They get past the 25th floor. Go on up. He says, okay, you can talk now. The guy turns to Peter and goes, why do we have to be quiet there? Well, that's where the Church of Christ are, and they think they're the only ones here. <laughs> Sad we can make that about other people, isn't it? <laughs> but anyway, um, that year of 1991, and December the 12th, I got baptized in the Holy Spirit, which uh, really did a number to all of my past theologies. It said all that died with the apostles. But it didn't. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. So I speak in tongues. I can lay hands on the sick and they recover. I've had people who were brain dead when I prayed for them come back to life. Serious. Three months brain dead. I went to the hospital because they asked me to come meet with the husband while they unplugged the machine. The Lord said, don't do that. He said to me, you pray for her till I tell you to quit. I said, okay. He, I got there, went in, looked at the doctor and the nurses. I said, will it matter if you don't unplug these machines for a little bit? No, she's been brain dead. And the only thing keeping her alive is these machines. She'll die within 60 seconds. After we unplug. I go, okay, well, I'm going to pray over her, so why don't all you go back out to your, your nurse's station out there where you can see all these monitors. They're all blank. Nothing's going on. And uh, what we'll do is I'll just pray over her for a while. And they go, okay. And the family, the sister was there and the daughter was there. And the daughter was mad as a hornet to God. You know what I mean? Mom was brain dead. She's losing, you know. Uh, Hannah just lost that young girl that she knew if she got that for every quest. I had a son that dropped dead at 27 of an aneurysm in his chest, just fell to the ground and dropped dead. I don't feel good. Right? Some of you have had husbands die or wives die. But praise God. He's the resurrection and the life. And even though we die, yet we shall live. What? I didn't hear that. Live. live. You got to believe that. I believe that. After my son died, the Lord made him come back to me in a vision, an open vision I had. I won't tell you about that right now. But anyway, I went and started praying for this lady. And after an hour of praying, nothing was going on. He had given me three particular psalms to prophesy over her and pray over her. And so I did. I'm sweating today because this graveyard's too big. <laughs> so I, I began to pray again. I went back and prayed those scriptures again. At two hours, I'm still praying. Now, I'm not, yeah, I'm not, I'm not a prayer who shouts and screams. I don't believe you. You got to yell at the devil for him to hear you. You just got to have authority. We can talk about that some other time. So I began to continue to pray. And in two and a half hours of praying constantly, again and again and again, this one machine on the wall goes beep. And all these nurses run in. What'd you do? You kicking wires or something? I go, no, I didn't touch anything. They go, that's a brainwave. I go, I don't know. I didn't touch anything. I've just been asking God to touch her and speaking life over her and the word of God over her. And they go, well, and it continued to, to signal. All of a sudden, the next one comes alive. And they go, what is going on here? I said, can I continue to pray? And they go, yeah, go ahead. This is a Seventh-day Adventist hospital, by the way. <laughs> I don't think they thought anything like that could ever happen. And so I continued to pray. At three hours, Vivian laying in that bed, stone cold from not moving around, you know, blood not circulating except through the pump, all of a sudden goes, 
They're going, oh my gosh, she's alive. And all the stuff comes back on. The next day, she gets discharged from the hospital with her husband and goes home. Ain't God good? They give us so many blessings undeserved. It's what we are. We ought to thank Him. Ought to praise Him. For He is good. Yes, He is good. God is good. Say that. God is good all the time. Hallelujah. God's not the... Ooh, he is, who can you feel the presence of God? Yeah. I, mean, I feel the presence of God. Either that or I'm getting ready to have a problem. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not. It's the presence of God. Hallelujah. Because <laughs> we prayed, we prayed for her, for Kaylin a couple of weeks ago on a Tuesday morning. She had a body earache and neck and stuff like that. You can just feel the presence of God. Just all of us in the prayer meeting is just feeling cool. You ever hear that? You ought to hear that. You ever hear that? And when you're praying, for, it's really it's like a truck. You know, it's just, it's just you just know, feel the presence of God come in. And what I'm talking about, you start to tingle, you know, and you start to have this sensation. You know, sometimes you can even smell roses. Woo! You never participated in that. You ought to come to a prayer meeting. <laughs> it would help you. Anyway, what was I saying? She went home. She went home with her husband and her entire family got saved. Amen. Daughter got saved. Sister was already saved. And her husband got saved. All of these people got saved out of that. I didn't even have to preach to them. And when Jesus shows up, he shows up right on time. He shows up in the nick of the moment, but it's called the time and space, called it. Nick and time when he shows up. It says when Jesus came to there, she came in the fullness of time. That little word there means a nick and time. There's all these nick and times where God wants to do a suddenly, Kevin. He wants to touch somebody through you with a suddenly. Right? You see, I'm nobody special. So when you look up here and hear me preaching this morning, I'm nobody special. I was told I couldn't sing by a teacher in college and then spent the last eight years singing as a lady singer in a gospel quartet. So I think she blew it wrong. But, right? What's your name? Thomas? That's my name. My middle name is Thomas. Wow. Cool. Nice to meet you, Thomas. What is this your wife? Amy, how are you? Aaron. I can't hear out of this one. I'm deaf in this one. Nice to meet you. But you see, I'm, I'm just, I'm a nobody. They got picked by somebody to use to touch somebody. That's all we are. We're nobodies that he makes into somebodies. Do you believe that? You see, I just had to obey. I didn't have this power in my hand. I didn't call upon the force. The force be with you, come alive again. I didn't do that. I didn't have that power. I just said, you want me to pray for how long? Till I tell you to stop. Oh, okay. Hour, two hours. I'll still keep going. I didn't tell you to stop, did I? No, sir. I didn't have some magic formula. I didn't do a Pentecostal two-step. You know, you see people at church do those dances, you know, thinking that the Holy Ghost is going to come again. Right? You ever seen that? I didn't jump and shout and dance about. I've done that before. Because I'm a nobody that God made into somebody to touch somebody. You were a nobody. <laughs> Matter of fact, all of us before Jesus, the Bible says we were enemies with God. We were not on his side, and he was not too happy. 
but he didn't give up on you. He didn't give up on me. And so anyway, I've seen that kind of thing happen. I got invited to go in 2002 to Australia, and I did these healing meetings. Can you clean my glasses off, honey? The sweat's all over the lens. I, I, so we did healing meetings up in uh, Mariba, which is northeast, high country of Australia. We were in Cairns, which is the tropical area of Australia. I got to swim on the Great Barrier Reef. That was really cool until they started yelling at me because I was getting on top of the coral and the tide was going out and they didn't want me to touch the coral. I really thought they, they were yelling because they thought I was a great white shark. <laughs> I had a white like, t-shirt on and all that, you know. And, uh, it was because if you touch the coral there, it would kill the coral. Your oil in your skin kills the coral. So I got to swim there and you can see people saved, delivered, and healed. Demons cast out, tumors dissolved, all kinds of people is transformed by the power of Jesus Christ. But I was nobody. That he turned into a somebody. And the reason he turned me into a somebody is because I said, Yes, Lord, yes, to your will and to your way. I'll say, Yes, Lord, yes, I will trust you and obey. When your spirit speaks to me, with my whole heart I'll agree. And my answer will be, Yes, Lord, yes. And so I try to live by that. Yes, Lord, yes. So I got to go in 2014, and I did uh, three seminars on worship, one in Manila for a week, one in Moss and South Lake Day down off. Did you know the Philippines is 6,000 islands? I didn't know that until I went there. So we flew from Manila to Cebu, and then I took a ferry over to Moss and South Lake Day and did another week of meetings. Then we went down to like Mindanao. Have you ever heard of Mindanao? You remember a, year, a few years ago about the radical al Sayyaf Muslim army in the Philippines capturing Americans? Do you remember that? Well, that was the time we went. <laughs> that was in 2004, so some of you are sitting here going, oh, I wouldn't even like that at that time. That's true, I am 70 years old. Wow. Oh. You start to hear it, it kind of goes faster. It's kind of like being on a train. You turn 70. Anybody here understand what I'm saying? You're old like me, right? Hallelujah. But I I look out of my eyes, and if I didn't have a stinking mirror to look into or somebody take a picture, I still think I was at 175. Well, maybe not. I could still look down, right? <laughs> but I would still think I'm young. I would still think I'm young. So anyway, I ought to get to the message and stop all this. But this is all part of the message anyway. But I got to go there and minister and saw people saved, delivered, and healed. Prophesied for seven hours straight over everyone in the audience. Seven hours straight. Individual words. They got in line. I start prophesying, get done with the word, and put my finger on their head, and they fall to the ground under the power of God. They drag them out of the way, and the next person step forward, prophesy over them, boom, boom. I took the pastor, and I go, hey, tell your people they don't have to fall. He goes, hey, pastor, we've never seen anything like this before. Filipinos would never fall down too prideful to do that. So I go, okay. Boom, boom. And you know what I'm sitting there doing? I'm the man of God with the power. <laughs> I didn't say that one time. I went, <laughs> you get, I get to do this with you. I, I said, I said to the Lord, you're letting me do this? <laughs> we were on Cheryl got on Norte the fast last day of the conference there. I didn't have time to prophesy over everybody. So I said, let's go to come around and pray over people real quick. I waved my hand one time and I thought it was Benny Hinn because 50 people boom, went to the ground. <laughs> Woo! But I'm a nobody that God made a somebody to touch somebody. I'm a nobody that God made a somebody so I could touch somebody. 
That's not the theme of my sermon. That just kind of goes today, don't it? Hmm. Why? I don't know. He chose me. But he did. And I said yes. So we moved out here a year and a half ago. And we were glad to be here at this church. How much time do I have? Pastor Justin said, take liberty, so I get about 2 o'clock. We okay with that? <laughs> Are we okay today? Yes, sir. Are we good? Hallelujah. I had somebody say, you went past all the clocks, and I didn't make it to the restaurant on time, and it was just backed up, and they had to wait. A I said, well, if I would have gone longer, all those people would have been gone, and you could have gone right in line. <laughs> so the next time my priest, and he was there, I went longer. He didn't like it. He didn't like it. I believe if you're sitting in this auditorium today, you're here for a purpose. You may have thought you just got up and came to church because it's what you've been doing. But God's got you here to hear what I got to say today from him. Are you blessed at all today so far? Is there anything I said touched your heart at all? Yes. Because you're a bunch of nobodies that God's making somebodies. You just got to recognize it. <laughs> you got to recognize it. Turn to the person next to you and say, I hope I can recognize it. Yeah. Because God is no respecter of persons. <laughs> If he'll take 12 people like the apostles and make them turn the world around, surely he can use you. You're, you're smarter than them fishermen. You, you got a junior high, high school, college degree, whatever. You got life experience that those fishermen didn't have. You know, you're not the outcast like Matthew, who's a tax collector. You're not like Mary, who was a prostitute, who had all these demons in her, and yet God chose her. Woo! Yeah. So when you look at me right now, in those eyes, everybody look at me. Look up here. I want you to know you're here today because God's got something for you. You individually. He's going to talk to you while I speak. You're probably going to hear things and you'll say, man, that was good what you said. And it wasn't what I said because it was the Holy Spirit speaking to you. You ever have that happen? And you realize that wasn't in the sermon, but it was what God was talking to you personally about. So every one of you, you're here for a purpose. You're here for a purpose. Amen? Amen. Now, when I preach, I believe preachers shouldn't preach for information. I don't preach for information. My sermons usually aren't point one, point two, point three. Although my wife said, what are your points? If they had notes, I said, I don't preach that way. You know that. But if I did have notes, I might say, the first point of this sermon is, we'll get to it in a minute. All right. <laughs> Would everyone stand up, please? Everyone that can stand up, please stand up. <clears throat> Hallelujah. I want you to pray this prayer with me. Are you ready? Are you ready? I believe God's going to encounter you in some way this morning. So I want you to pray after me. Heavenly Father, I give you praise. And I worship and adore you. Thank you for loving me. As I listen today, give me ears to hear and a heart to receive what you have for me this morning. May your Holy Spirit bring life to what Pastor Jay is going to share. I pray for those around me that their heart and their mind will be receptive to what you have for them today. I thank you in advance for all you will do in me 
and through me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Now I want this side to stay standing, to turn this way, this side to turn that way. And I want you to say these words. This side is going to say it loud to them. You're saying it to this group of people. Say, you are highly favored. Say that. You are highly favored. Okay, let's try it again on count of three. One, two, three. You are highly favored. Say it back to them. One, two, three. You are highly favored. Now, everybody together, say it loud as you can. You are highly favored. Now, say it this way. I am highly favored. Say it. I am highly favored. Say it one more time. I am highly favored. Hallelujah. That's my first point. You are highly favored. Just go ahead and be seated. I'll probably have you stand again at some point. You never know. About 1.30, probably have you stand up. <laughs> Hallelujah. Person back in the back one. He should have had the heart attack stay away. No, no, no. Hey, anybody have a Bible? I have a Bible that's on my iPad and I have one on my iPhone and that's what I use. I started to bring my old Bible but it's falling apart because I preach out so much the pages are falling out. And I, I love it on here. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 20 through 22 Are you with me this morning, Edgar? Yes. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. How about you, Tony? Are you with me this morning? Good. I can tell Kevin's with me because he's been smiling at me. He's going, this guy is funny. He's a crazy guy. How we let him get up there? All right. It says, for all the promises of God in him, that's Christ, are yes and amen. Say that. For all the promises of God in him are yes and in him amen. To the glory of God through us. What that means is everything that God promised the Israelites is yes to you as well. And amen. Now we've been praying for Israel and I'm glad we've been praying for Israel because the Bible commands us to. But I believe that we are also Israel. The Bible says in, that we in Romans that we are spiritual Israel grafted into the, to the vine. Right? And so he says here to the Corinthians. All the promises of God that you read in the Old Testament, because that's what he'd be talking about at this time. He, New Testament hadn't come together, so he'd be talking about the Old Testament. All the promises of God are yes and amen in Christ Jesus. So as I share these things in the next few moments, these verses that I'm going to read are for you. They're not for the person next to you necessarily. They're for you specifically, individually. No, that means they're going to be for the person next to you, right? But you need to listen for you, not for them. Why is only going, did you hear that, honey? <laughs> no, it's about you. God wants to talk to you today. So all the promises of God are yes and amen in Christ Jesus. Now, I like animals. Anybody here like animals? I mean, I like watching the uh, planet shows, Ge National Geographic. My favorite animal is the elephant. I have no clue why. I have 15 figurines of elephants in my office at home. I've got two of them that have big elephants with their little baby elephant with them. Tusks coming out, trumpets up. I've got single elephants blowing their trumpets up. I got bookends that are trump elephants. But you know, an elephant is a big, big old, big fat beast with wrinkly old leather-like skin and big old trunks for feet. You wouldn't want him to step on you. He's not the cute little Dumbo, although I like the movie Dumbo. But you know, elephants are really cool animals. I also like wolves. I think wolves are a cool animal. So I got three figurines above my desk, on top of my desk. A pack of wolves getting ready to attack. And two other packs howling at the night. Because I think wolves are cool. 
But they don't look a thing like my elephants. I'm totally disappointed in them. I wish they knew how to blow a trumpet like an elephant. But they don't. They just go, I just don't understand it. How come the wolf can't act like the elephant? That's just crazy. I like elephants the best. Why doesn't the wolf do that? Of course, I got a friend that, that lives in South Africa. I talk to him every now and then. <laughs> and, and we were talking one day. And he lives in Nelspruit, South Africa, right up by Kruger National Park, which is a preserve. We were talking, and I go, what's that noise? Turn the phone, and there's these two monkeys coming in his window. <laughs> these little monkeys coming in. And they were cute as could be. But why can't they act like the elephant? I don't understand them. I got two dogs and two cats at home. And they don't, well, one of them eats like an elephant. Sadie, she's a Bajon Frise. She's a Frenchy dog. Right? But they, they don't act like each other. Because you see, God said each creature he created was to be created after its own kind. God created them on the sixth day. And he said they're all to be after their own kind. So a wolf will never be like an elephant. And an elephant will never be like a wolf. A dog can howl, but not as good as a wolf. Right? I, I like those big bull mastic dogs. Those are cool. Even pit bulls are pretty cool if they're tame enough. And don't tear you to pieces. I, I like alligators. They're an interesting species of animal. I like them. I like all these animals. But they're all unique. Each one is unique. Every species is created after its own kind. And every elephant doesn't give birth. An elephant, you'll never see an elephant give birth to a tiger. You'll never see an elephant give birth to a chimpanzee. And vice versa. Because that's how God made them. He says he created us as a peculiar species to male and female created he them. That's why I don't buy into this transgender garbage. It's a trick of Satan to confuse people because the people who are wanting to be transgender, they don't have an identity problem. They have a mental problem. And what they need is to be redeemed by the Redeemer. They need their life to be turned around by Jesus, the Son of God, who on that day was the Word of God that said, let it be. And went and formed them, male and female, and said that's who they will be. And it's sad that we're trying to convince our little children that they could be one or the other if they aren't. It's not true. God created, God created you the way you were born. If you're black, you're black. You can do all you want to try to change your skin tone, but it just ends up like Michael Jackson, the sad man. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. You can do all you want if you're white to be black. Just sit out in the sun all the time and you'll get skin cancer. Because God created you the way you are. If you're Hispanic, you're Hispanic. Whatever your makeup is, you are who you are. Now, there are things you can control about that. If you don't like your brown hair, you can dye it blonde. But you keep going to the hairdresser to make sure the roots don't show. If uh, you're heavy like me, you can go to the gym and you can lose weight, right? You can quit eating at the Chef Lee's Chinese buffet. <laughs> oh, it's good. Yeah. I got to cut it out now. But you are who you are. God. Listen, listen. Turn in your Bibles over to Psalm 139. Psalm 139. Am I doing okay with you? All right. 
Psalm 139, verse 1 says, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. Ha. He said, you've searched me and you've known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thought afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word on my tongue, but behold, O Lord, you know it all together. You have hedged me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. Jump down to verse 13. For you formed my inner parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works. Now I'm going to stop right there for just a second. He says, I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Then he says, marvelous are your works. He's talking about himself. You are marvelous, a work of God. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. I don't care what's going on in you that you don't like. You've been made by God to be who you are. You are. Even the Down syndrome baby was knit together in the mother's womb for a purpose. They're not a mistake. God had a purpose for them. And we need to understand what God's purpose is for a Down syndrome baby would be. I had a couple in my church in Sonora who had a baby who had a hole in his heart and he, and, and he lived for eight days and died. God had a purpose for that. Everybody in the family was mad about it. But the berries realized God had a purpose and that purpose helped them to understand the love of God to a greater degree as he comforted them in their loss. Was it easy? No. But God made them that way. Now there are times when drugs will interfere and the result of the baby will be impacted by the drugs. We understand that. But one of the things I want you to know this morning is you are made the way God wants you to be made. Just like the elephant, just like the wolf, just like the kangaroo, they all have their purpose in God's creation. Turn to the person next to you and just say, you are who God made you to be. You're not a mistake. Oh, we we ended up having Billy. He was a mistake. We, we got pregnant before we got married. No, he wasn't a mistake. God did him together in the mother's womb. I either believe that or I don't. And if I don't believe that, if I don't believe that, I can't believe any of this. It's all or nothing. There's a lot of people who don't believe that God can do miracles today. But the Bible says he's the same yesterday, today, forever, and he does. He says, I'm going to pour my spirit on all flesh. He says, you're going to do that to those who are far off. We're far off. He says, the sons and daughters are going to prophesy. There's going to be people who have visions and dreams. And that's what he says is going to happen. And people today say, oh, that doesn't happen anymore. Well, let me ask you a question. If you can't believe that, how in the world can you believe you're ever going to go to heaven? Because how do you even know there's a heaven? How do you even know there's a heaven if you can't believe what he says? If I can't believe those verses, I surely can't believe about heaven that I have never seen. And I've only been talked about. Right? I have to believe it all. I have to know it all. I just can't believe and pick and choose what I want to believe. i got to say, this is what the Word of God says. I believe it. Take a look at Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1, verse 28. Now the story is, is that Mary is this little girl, probably anywhere from 12 to 16 years old at this time. She's doing her own thing in her own house. She's a really good girl. And all of a sudden, this angel shows up in her house. <clears throat> Anybody here think you'd wet your pants? <laughs> uh, you know, I hear these people say, oh, I saw angels. Now almost everybody that saw an angel freaked out. Come on now. 
Uh, angels kind of appear in such a majestic way that most human beings go, whoa, not go, oh, look at the angel. <laughs> but look what happens. The angel says, having come in, the angel said to her, rejoice, highly favored one. Say that. Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. Look down at verse 30. Then the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found, what's the word? Favor. With God. The word favor is to be accepted, to be put in a place of special honor. And so Mary, Mary, uh, Mary has this angel appear to her. And he says, you're going to get pregnant. And she goes, yeah, how's that going to happen? I don't even have, I'm not even married. I haven't known a man. Don't, don't know how that works. He said, well, what's going to happen is the Holy Spirit is going to come upon you and overshadow you, and he's going to impregnate you, and he'll put the Son of God in you. Do you believe that today? Amen. If you can't believe that, you might as well throw the whole book away. Right? <laughs> The Episcopal Church today doesn't believe that. Did you know that? They think that's a fairy tale. Yeah, they do. That's why they're a messed up church. I'm not preaching against the church. I'm preaching against heresy there. But you know what? Turn your Bible over to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. Am I okay, Kaylin? Yes. Okay. I'm just getting going. Really? Yeah. <laughs> that was all my introduction. I'm going. I had to let you know who I was before I spoke to you. <laughs> Verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> who has, what's the word? Yes. Who? Yes. With every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Now the Apostle Paul tells us that the things that are seen are not are temporal, and the things that are unseen are eternal, and that the unseen world is the real world. That's what the Apostle Paul tells us. So here he's telling these people, you've been blessed with everything that's real. Everything is real. Every spiritual blessing is yours. Hallelujah. Everything is yours. Now take a look at it, what it says, verse 4. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, we won't get into all the theology of that, but he did, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Before we move off of that, so many people think the word holy is all about what you do. It's not. The word holy is about who you are. I'll say that again. Being holy is not, not about what you do. It's about who you are. We sang those songs this morning. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Well, does that mean that God's worried about sinning? Is God tempted? Is God is got a problem with sin, so he's got to stay holy? No, the word holy means to be separated unto different than everything else. But God is not a man that he should lie, the word says. God is far above. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts, and his ways higher than our ways. So when we say that God is holy, it's not about his conduct of keeping away from sin. Is about who he is of being separate and far and above. And when God says to you, be holy, he wants you to be separate from everybody else. He doesn't want you to look like, smell like, and taste like anybody that's going to hell. He wants to, you to be in such a place that you're identifiable as one who is separated unto him. That's why he, says he calls us out from amongst them. Why? Because he doesn't want people to be confused by who we are. He wants people to know that you're on fire for Jesus Christ because of his great love for you. He wants people to know that he is your all in all. 
When Peter says, be ye holy, even as the Lord God is holy, and then he says, be ye holy in all your conduct. He's not talking about, well, you can't, you can't lie to that guy that you're working for. He's not talking about that. He's talking about you've got to be separated in your conduct so that people see the difference in you. So when the guy next to you was stealing at the job, you're never going to be implicated with him because you would never do that. Right? When the when the women in the YouTube movement were making accusations against all these people for all their misbehavior and sexual stuff that was going on, you remember all that stuff a few years ago? We don't have to worry about that if we're keeping ourselves away from that and separated unto God. If I treat women with dignity and respect men, and I don't view them as a sexual object, but as a person that is a sister in Christ, who God loves with a passion, who God has called to be somebody in his kingdom just like you, then I don't have to worry about somebody accusing me of being immoral with them. Because I never would be. You understand what you, you get what I'm saying on that? It's not but it's not about obeying a set of rules. Holiness is not about rules. Holiness is about relationship that I separate myself unto him. That's why Jesus says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. He does not say, if you can meet, keep my commandments, it shows you love me. There's a lot of people that keep his commandments but don't love him. But if I truly love him, I will do what he says. When my wife says, honey, will you get up and get me a glass of water? I look at her and I go, get out and get it yourself. <laughs> you got two legs. What's wrong with you? No, I don't do that. I get up, go in the kitchen, pull out the glass, spit in it. <laughs> get out the glass, put ice in it, get her water, take it back to it. Say, here's your water, honey. Right? When, when I get up in the morning and I walk into the kitchen and she's got my two strips of bacon going there and she's made my potato patty, I didn't have to command her to do that. She knew that's what I like. And if, you know, I told somebody that my wife was abusive, that she beats me up all the time. And they go, really? I go, yeah, she gets up at 6, I get up at 7. <laughs> Came through right fine. <laughs> That's one of those you got to really think through. <laughs> but if I get up before her, I can go in, I fix my two pieces of bacon, my eggs, and my potatoes, and I go sit down. I care less what she gets. Right? No. I get up, and I go cook her her bacon, and I get the skillet ready for her egg. She likes her egg just a specific way, no burnt edges. I try to do that. I say, I failed. I leave the skillet too hot before I put the egg in. I'm learning that. But I don't do that because she commanded me to do it. I do that because I love her. When we go to the store, and we're walking through the store, and this young girl in her 20s walks by in a halter top and short shorts pulled down almost to expose herself. I'm not going, ooh, 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 ooh. I'm not doing that. Because my eyes are for my wife. I'm not doing that. Now, did she tell me you can't look at other women? Yeah, she says you killed me if I did. <laughs> no, she didn't. But I don't do it because I love her. Jesus says, if you really love me, you'll keep my commands. You do what I ask you to do. A true sign of somebody's love for you is that they listen to your needs, your wants, your desires, and follow through with it. Uh, many, many husbands and wives are in divorce. I ended up divorced after 35 years, so I know how this works. I do. I missed some things in my first marriage. It was sad. 
35 years and all of a sudden I'm divorced. That was weird. Weird. Some of you are going, you've been divorced and you're up there talking. Yep, I am. Because I'm a nobody that God made a somebody. And when that happened to me, I was shocked as could be. And I went through two years of terrible, terrible garbage. And guess what? I knew I was highly favored. I knew my God had my back. I knew that I didn't do anything wrong. I knew that her affair with my worship leader was her problem, not my problem. But I missed it somehow. So in the divorce, I didn't pay no alimony. And I got the house in California. <laughs> I came out on top, and she didn't. And I didn't even get a lawyer because I have somebody better. When he, the Holy Spirit, comes, he will be my advocate. He will be my lawyer. And he said, don't get a lawyer. And I said, I won't get a lawyer. And he said, you just listen to what I say, and you'll come out on top. And I did what he said to do. And I got the house. <laughs> Hallelujah, had it been a lot of money. Hallelujah. And now I have a house here in Arkansas. I never thought it had, I sold that house, and I never thought I'd have another house, but God brought that about. But listen to what it says. <laughs> Got to get going here. I'm running out of time. Uh, it's, it's almost, well, I've got another hour and a half, so I'm okay. <laughs> I'm just taking Justin's word for it. He said I could take liberty. <laughs> You guys are going to go, I never want to hear him preach again. <laughs> now look what it says. He says, he blessed us with every spiritual blessing, heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Now listen to this part. Having predestined. Say that. Having predestined. Predestined. Say it. Predestined. Say it again. He predestined us to adoptions as sons or daughters by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will now this is the verse I want you to pay attention to to the praise of the glory of his grace by which he made us accepted in the beloved now I want you to underline that word accepted if you want to or put it in a note or whatever log it in your brain it's the same word, carito, which is from the word charis for grace. That means highly favored. God made you highly favored. Do I, let me say that again. God made you highly favored. God made you highly favored in Jesus Christ. I, I hate, I hate this, so don't say it to me because I really hate it. I hate when people say, well, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. I'm not a sinner saved by grace. I once was a sinner, but now I'm a saint. I'm a saint. Paul says to the saints in Ephesus, to the saints in Corinth, to the saints in Philippi, he calls the church, he calls Christians, he calls us saints. Because the word saints means one set apart to God's purposes. I'm a saint. I'm not a sinner anymore. I may sin every now and then, but my propensity is not to sin. My propensity is to follow God and do what he wants me to do. The thing in my heart is not to go run after sin. The thing in my heart is to run after God. The thing in my heart is to say, Lord Jesus, use me today. I'm not waiting for Sunday morning to pray for somebody. If I'm at the store and I see a need, I say, Lord Jesus, how can I minister that need? If I'm listening to the Holy Spirit every day, every moment of the day, because he highly favors me, then I'm listening for him to speak to me about somebody. <laughs> and so I go into a restaurant store one day, and as I walk in, what was your name again? Amy. Aaron. I called you Amy at first, didn't I? And that stuck in my mind, Thomas. Aaron. I walk in this restaurant, and the Lord talked to me about this girl It was my waitress. Told me that her boyfriend hit hit her. <clears throat> but she should not break up with her boyfriend. And I thought, man, I'd be out of that. I'd be out of there by that time. The Lord said, No, he's going to go to church with her tonight. He's going to be saved tonight. 
you ain't gonna be a new man. So you go tell her not to break up with her boy, but tell him to go to church to live. So I called her outside afterwards. I got one, paid my bill, I said, Can I talk to you outside? She goes, Oh, yeah. And I go, Hi, my name is Jay. I have a word from the Lord for you. And she goes, Oh, really? What do you mean? Well, God was talking to me about you. God was talking to you. I go, Yeah. The Holy Spirit lives in me, and I can talk to him, and he talks to me. I'll show you. Your boyfriend hit you this last week. She goes, ah, How do you know that? I said, because the Holy Spirit told me. That's what I just told you. Did you not listen? <laughs> I want to say that. And she goes, the Holy Spirit told you that? And I go, yeah. And uh, he wants you not to break up with him. Because you're thinking about breaking up with him right now. And you're torn in your heart and you've got this struggle going on. She goes, yeah. And I said, the Lord said, don't do it. But invite him to church tonight with you. You go up here to Assembly of God Church, don't you? And she goes, yeah. How'd you know that? And I said, well, the same God told me you got hit, told me you went there. She goes, really? I go, yeah. And she goes, uh, well, what, what's going to happen? He's going to get saved tonight at their spaghetti dinner up there. She did. He did. Went back. She was crying, telling me how much he got saved, how much a different man he is. Now they're getting married and everything was cool. That's pretty cool, huh? Mm -hmm. Hallelujah, man. I'm a great prophet. Woo! No, hallelujah. I got to participate. I got to see somebody. Mm. Just like you got to see the whole congregation get into it when you and Pamela started leading worship this morning. Ooh, now he's up there, all you worship leaders. You get to participate with bringing the Holy Spirit into an environment that causes people to get touched. <laughs> Isn't that cool, man? That's cool. Instead of sitting there popping pills. I get to worship him and get a better feeling. <laughs> now let me tell you. Here's how much he favors us. Ooh, listen to what he says. That he has made us accepted in the beloved. I'm out of time, I think. but Am I okay for a moment or more? I'm going to have a vote. Do I hear a yes? Yes. Do I hear any no's? Okay, you're afraid. <laughs> I know there's some no's out there. I've heard Pastor Joseph go way longer than this. So, but, uh, and, you know, I'm a guest speaker. They don't want me to ever come back then. I better preach what I want. But you're highly favored by God. Turn to the person next to you and say, you're highly favored by God. I don't want to embarrass anybody, but if you've been born again, raise your right hand. Just hold it up. Keep it up. If you've been born again, raise your right hand. Okay? If you've been filled with the Holy Spirit, raise your left hand. Hallelujah. If you're filled with the Holy Spirit. I want you to wave your hands and go, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. You've been born again. You've been filled with the Holy Spirit. Woo! There it is, right there. Oh. <laughs> Whoa, <laughs> you've been filled with Holy Spirit. Paul says that we will have the fullness of God dwelling in us. Now, here's my point in my sermon, because I haven't really got to it. <laughs> I know. I just uh, want you to know something. There are some of you here today that... You were raped. You were abused. You were hit by a parent, an uncle. Someone in your life sadly abused you. There's some of you here today that you were told growing up that you were stupid. That you would never amount to anything. There's some of you here today that were told that you would be a failure. And you had in your yearbook sign, less likely to succeed. And you've lived with that all your life. Even though you've come to Jesus, you still filter everything through filters of low esteem. Why, well, God wouldn't use me because who am I? Who am I? I tell you who you are. You are a blood-bought saint of God. 
I'll tell you who you are. You're no different than Mary Magdalene, who had seven demons and had been a prostitute who became one of the greatest voices for the gospel in all the world during the first century because she was highly favored by God. You're highly favored by God. Let me say that one more time. You are highly favored by God. Whatever low self-esteem you've got, you need to get rid of and recognize if God be for me, who can be against me? That verse is true. But we don't want to believe that. We want to believe the lie that was told about us. And so when it comes time to do something, we listen to that lie that the enemy told us through somebody else. The enemy comes to kill, steal, and destroy. He doesn't come to lift you up. He comes to kill whatever vision you have, whatever dreams you have. He comes to steal whatever you have in your life. He comes to destroy your life. But God says that Jesus says it this way. He says, I came that they may have life, and they may have it more abundantly. You see, Jesus didn't come to the church as the older policeman looking to smack you down if you make a mistake. That's not Jesus' M.O. Jesus is not one who will abuse his children. Jesus is one who will cuddle you, will nurture you. The Bible doesn't say hell, fire, and damnation preaching brings repentance. It says the goodness of God leads us to repentance. God's goodness towards you leads you to repent. It's God's goodness toward us that causes us to have joy unspeakable and full of glory. You, it says the eyes of the Lord. And, 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 whoo, it says over in, let me read it for you here. Let me get it real quick here. Woo. Hallelujah. 2 Chronicles 16, 9. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. You see, what God saw, God was looking around one day. Church and says, anybody? Anybody there? <clears throat> oh, oh, oh. Look at me. Look at down there. That lady named Pamela that I created in her mother's womb. Look at her. She's got a heart to, to come to me. Holy Spirit, go to her. Convict her of sin, righteousness, and judgment. And bring her to me. Let her receive Jesus. So Pamela comes to Jesus. Why? Because God was looking for her. And he saw a heart looking for him. Kevin is there. He was growing up in the church. He could be one of those kids in the church that grows up and just wanders away. But instead, God sees a heart longing for reality of God. And he says, Holy Spirit. Go to Kevin. Get down there. And bring him to me. Kevin comes to Jesus. Terry's there one day. Terry's a messed up young man. But he says, I want more. A lot of life. And God looks down and says, Look at Terry's turning his heart toward me. Get down there now. Talk to him. Lead him to me. Change his life. And all of a sudden, Terry's life changes, and he's a new man in Christ. Edgar's out there, this Hispanic guy, out there wondering if anybody really cares about short people. I <laughs> <laughs> haven't listened to all of us tall people tell jokes about him. And he's feeling bad, and his life is not going the way it should go. And what happens for, Terry, uh, for Edgar? Edgar gets this tingling in him to say, I want more of God, I think. I think I do. And the Lord looks down from heaven, and all of a sudden, there's Edgar, go talk to him. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit moves into Edgar, brings him to Jesus. There's not a one of you here today that know Jesus as your Savior and Lord, that that hasn't been the fact. That God, looking from heaven, saw something in your heart that was turning to him, and he said, there they are. Now let me tell you, how highly favored are you? There's 6 billion people on the earth. Over 300 million in the United States. And yet you're saved. <gasps> Whoa. 6 billion people and yet you get saved. Because God saw your heart turning to him. And he said, Go to him. 
And not only that, you're not only highly favored to be saved, but then he said, I'm going to fill you with my fullness. Now let me put aside some of your false theology. The Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, uh, he's not some minor part of the Godhead. The Holy Spirit is God himself. God himself. God himself is the Holy Spirit. And when, when I pray, when I pray, I don't pray to somebody out there. I pray to he who lives in me. The Bible tells me that Jesus comes in me. Paul says it. Jesus says it in the Revelation. Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in, and I will dine with him, and he with me. We'll have fellowship together. So when the Holy Spirit comes in, you get Jesus and the Father all at once. Now there's some mystery about how he can be in heaven in the same, the same place as me. But what I know is he's in me. If you've been born again, he's in you. You don't have to, you don't have to fret things. You just got to let him know. I said to the Holy Spirit the other day, I said, Hey, seems like your house here is in trouble. I don't know what's going on here. But the Bible says that you dwell right here in the innermost parts of my being. So will you help me with this innermost parts of my being? <laughs> when I got COVID in 2020, I was in the hospital for six days with COVID. They had me on all kinds of stuff. They didn't put me on a respirator, but boy, they had me disappear and all that stuff. They opened my body that first day. That night, I laid in that bed in the hospital, and I said, in Jesus' name, I curse you, COVID. I said, I curse this bacteria, this virus that's in me, and I command my lungs to function right. I command my heart to function right. I command all of my system within my body to function right. Because I am bought by the blood of Jesus and I am highly favored by him. And you've intruded on the property of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you have no authority to dwell in here. Amen. Holy Spirit expelled that COVID. Amen. And I immediately went from 89 oxygen to 94% oxygen. Immediately. Boom. And they only kept me in there to observe me. And I went home and... Woo! And he continued to heal me. Why? Because I am the dwelling place of the Lord God Almighty. I'm a nobody that he came inside of and made a somebody. Amen, right? You're a somebody because you were a nobody that he changed and made you a somebody. That's right. When you look at yourself in the mirror in the morning, you need to say, Tony, you're a somebody because somebody changed a nobody into a somebody. You need to be able to say to yourself, I am Christ on this earth. You say, oh, that's heresy. No, it's not. No, it's not. I'm the only Jesus people may see. And I have him living in me. His Holy Spirit. He, Godhead, lives in me. And when I take a step, he takes a step. When I walk in a room, I don't expect to be influenced by other people. I expect to influence them. When I walk into a party and I'm going to parties, I don't go into the party to get drunk. I go into the party to change the atmosphere. And it's amazing how quick the booze goes away. It's amazing how the behavior changes. I put together a softball league in Sonora, California, where they didn't have one. And everybody that was all alcoholic out there on the ball field, all these guys started getting saved. All these guys. We put together, we ended up having two softball leagues on a Friday night at all churches. And then I took my team out of the church league, and I put my team into the regular league, and we won the regular league. All of those wimpy Christians beat all the heathens. And they're all going, how could they do that? Because it's Christ in me, the hope of glory. I have Christ living in me. And, and, and so I went and played one baseball, softball turn to hit five home runs. 
One to left field, one to center field, two to right field. And I'm going to look right hand the batter. And then another one to left field. And I hit that ball so hard it went over all the trees. And these big burly guys who we beat in that game from Stockton go, you don't look like you could hit that way. And I go, that's because Jesus is in me. And he helps me to overcome my weaknesses. Really? And I still have the softball that team signed for me. That's the one trophy I kept. I used to play about 75 softball games a year until I tore my rotator cuff and the Lord said, you're done. I said, oh, okay. Focus on some other thing. But I saw alcoholics because of the testimony of people who were nobodies that became somebody, touched somebody out of the ball field. And that somebody got saved and became a somebody and touched somebody else. And I know, I can tell you, if you go to Sonora, California right now, there's at least 100 guys who are saved because of playing softball. Because men would go out there and display Christ to them as they played. After the game, we would all get together on the mound. We would pray, and you would hear this shout, Jesus! Hallelujah. It would reverberate throughout all the ballparks. It would be like in Sheraton. There's that big ballpark complex over there. I don't know if they got one here in Whitehall. But we had four big old fields out there. Now, why did I tell you that? Because I'm special. I tell you that because I'm handpicked by God and you're not. And so I have all these wonderful giftings, all these wonderful talents. And so I get to be the man on campus, so to speak. Hallelujah. No, I tell you that because if the Bible says I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, do I believe that verse or don't I? Do you believe that verse? Yes. They live like you believe that verse. You see, it's not about your behavior, but it's about who you are. You are highly favored by God. I don't care whether your mother beat you or your father beat you. I don't care whether you were raped. I don't, my secretary for 20 years was raped every day from the age of 13, uh, 7 to the age of 13. When I came to pastor in Sonora, I found out about that. Began to help her. Began to pray through with her. Got her healed in the spirit. Got her healed of all that. She went back and told her brother she forgave him. And she ended up seeing her brother saved five years later. And she walked in, in healing and wholeness. Not because Pastor Jay is so good. But God said, Cheryl, I highly favor you. And she recognized that. You see, today you're here. And some of you got baggage. You got to go, I, I don't want to carry this thing on my back anymore. Uh, give me your purse, honey, please. My wife has this really pretty purse. Hey, you like that little purse, ladies? Uh, I sell it today for $59.99. <laughs> but it has these straps on it. I'm not going to do it. But it goes here, and then you put it on your back, and it's a backpack. Does that got some weight to it? Yeah, it's got some weight to that little thing, doesn't it? She carries that on her back, so that means she's strong, so I don't mess with her. She slap me around. No, but what it means is we have baggage the enemy wants us to carry. And some of us carry that baggage more than others. And if you're here today and you've got baggage, you need to let it go. You need to let it go. Pastor, I don't have any. Well, let me ask you a question. Are you accomplishing all you think you can for God? Are, are you struggling? Paul says to lay aside the sin that easily besets us. And run with perseverance the race set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author, the perfecter of our faith. Are you running? Where are you sitting down? I think it's interesting, he says, the sin that easily besets us. It's so easy to screw up. 
Isn't it, guys? All you got to do, guys, is click on the wrong thing and you're on a pornography site. And then you don't turn your computer off. You go, oh, I've got to get out of this. You click it again. It goes to another site. You're going, oh, I'll try to get off it. And then for a long, a man's addicted to pornography and he's in the church. It's so easy, ladies, isn't it, men, to get with some people and start to have a nice prayer request that turns into gossip about somebody else and find ourselves back fighting somebody in the name of prayer. <gasps> he said that. Yeah, I did. I'm not here to condemn you. But what keeps us doing those things? What keeps us in a place of envy, wishing we could be on the worship team, wishing we could do this, or, or how come they don't use me in this area, or, or what about this, or what about that? Well, the reason is, is because there's some package of your past you're holding on to, and you're not recognizing how highly favored you really are in Christ. You are highly favored by God if you've come to Him, and you need to let all that go this morning. Would you stand to your feet this morning? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Because I am highly favored. This morning, I want you to hear these words as we come close to closing here. Psalm 139, verse 17 says, How precious also are your thoughts to me, O God! How great is the sum of them! If I should count them, they would be more in number than the sand. Would you close your eyes while you're standing there for a minute? And on your mind's eye, I want you to picture the Sahara Desert or the Mojave Desert where there's a lot of sand or the beach. Uh, uh, you see all that sand? Can you count? Can you see your hand reaching down and scooping up that sand and then pouring through your fingers? As it pours through your finger, you're trying to count every grain of sand. And you can't, can you? Why? Because there's so much you can't count. God says about you today, each of you here today, my thoughts toward you are more than that. <laughs> I, the God of the universe, have created the heavens, the stars, the moon, created every living thing, created you and your mother's womb. I think about you every day. My thoughts about you every day are more than those saints. Because I highly favor you. I highly favor you. Would you say this out loud to yourself with your eyes closed? I'm highly favored by God. Say it again. One more time. Everybody in the auditorium, say it again. I'm highly favored by God.